So first of all, I would like to thank you for Klogner, to Klogner for the invitation to this uh, really nice as, uh, afternoon and evening with, uh, with my colleagues and friends, Matteo and Fadi. It is a huge and tremendous effort of them uh, to do these fantastic uh, presentations and to fantastic discussions. I would like to thank all of them for, for, the, for the support and uh, the discussion. And the, the third part of this evening is talking about the large bone reconstruction in pre-implant surgery and post pre implantitis. In our daily clinic, we have this, uh, these uh, situations, we, this quite often situations that we solve like this. However, nowadays we have problems, really big problems that are coming to our clinics, problems like this situation or this situation. What could we have do? We have to do in these cases, what we can do in these cases. We can solve it from the biological point of view, or is it go for the, for example, the prosthetic point of view? I would like to uh, ask two questions and then answer. The first question, is, uh, could be which are the causes of those large bone defects and the other question that I would like to answer is how can we treat this kind of bone defect first of all answering the first question I pulled in four different four different uh, situations the causes of these large defects large cyst but implantitis which is quite often nowadays Remember, for almost 50% of uh, patients have preimplantitis. 40, uh, sorry, 22% of uh, of patients have preimplantitis, and 45% uh, have a preimplant diseases. Other uh, other um, issues should be the accidents, which uh, which is it's not quite often in our daily clinic. But the other often cause is preimplantitis, but it's not not so much often. And the, uh, and the defects that, uh, for example, preimplantitis can uh, create after uh, its instruction should be higher in preimplantitis than in preimplantitis. So I will quote two main causes the large cyst and also finally preimplantitis. For example, this case a patient that was treated by means of implant placement many years ago, and we have this situation like uh, after nine years of, uh, of the treatment. You see that uh, the bone loss is so much extensive, so we went for the extraction of those implants and the defect was like this. And what we can do to solve this problem to achieve this result? And in this another case, for example, a patient that had a large in the anterior, anterior sextant in the upper jaw that was treated many years ago. After that, uh, different surgeons tried to uh, reconstruct this uh, defect in the anterior side, but that uh, the result of those uh, interventions were, uh, were worse than the beginning, leading to these situations when I treated this patient. How can we treat this patient with this kind of defects? With a result like this. So answering this question, we go first of all with the principle, with the basic concepts of guided bone marrow innovation. I have to remember that these concepts were coming from the guided tissue regeneration around teeth. And this concept basically that we wanted was inhibit the epithelial growth, and also to inhibit the gingival connective tissue growth, promoting the bone growth and inhibiting also the colonization of bacteria into the defect like this. But going more deeper in this topic, the fourth, the basic concept of this uh, guided bone regeneration could be uh, summarized in four concepts. In the primary bone healing or tension-free bone closer, the second one should be 
the space creation and maintenance. The third one, the stability of the bound. And finally, the fourth one should be the angiogenesis. However, there are other factors that we can manage. And this factor should, uh, could be the selection of the biomaterials. And we can select the bone that we want to use in those cases, or, or, or also the type of membrane. And the more critical and more crucial in the selection of this kind of, of situation should be the selection of the membrane. As you know, there are two different uh, types of membrane, resolvable membranes, and also the DPTV membranes, which is non-resolvable. But the cases that we are dealing with in our, in our clinic, main, uh, of the, the, most of them, we are treating with uh, uh, resolvable membranes. And we, have, we want to select a correct membrane to treat some cases in our clinic. And there are two types of uh, natural or um, collagen membranes or resolvable membranes, which is the natural collagen membrane or synthetic collagen membranes. And the most used in the literature and also by the clinicians is the normal resolution membrane or the natural collagen membrane, which is the biogen membrane. This membrane has presented two uh, layers, the smooth layer that go against the soft tissue and the porous layer that go against uh, the, 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 the bone tissue. However, the sponsor of this, uh, this kind of membrane, I'm sorry, I know what happened. Um, my presentation was closed. Wait a minute, please. Sorry. Right now. It was this. So the sponsor said that the uh, the barrier effect of this kind of membrane of natural collagen membrane should be a range from the eight, uh, eight weeks to 24 weeks. However, there are many, many, many uh, articles and evidence that told us that the result, the barrier effect and the time of resorption of this kind of a uh, natural collagen membrane should be less than expected. And in this experimental study, with the three months of follow-up in rats, they prove or they test different membranes. In this case, we have we have the uh, the collagen membrane, the natural collagen membrane, which is this one. Okay, and also they were tested, uh, for example, the pericardium membrane, or for example, um, another more. Um, Another kind of membranes that well, the, the, the time of resorption was more uh, more lasted in time. So in this case, they compared the natural collagen membrane and the pericardial membrane. As you can see here, the outcome variable was the thickness of the membrane in time that is related also to the barrier effect of this kind of membranes. And the bursts that are in different colors represent the, as you can see here, the time. One week, two weeks, four weeks, one week, two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks. Remember, three months. As you can see, the thickness in time of the pericardial membrane is stable. However, in the natural collagen membrane, like this, it's very thick at the, uh, at the beginning, but it's really thin at the end of the study. And this is related also with the barrier effect, as you can see here, of those kind of membranes. And that was tested by this experimental study. Also, uh, this study was performing ducks in a six months of follow-up in which they compare a natural quantum membrane compared to the pericardial membrane in this case. And the barrier effect of the natural collagen membrane was four to eight weeks 
compared to the dense group is the pericardium membrane, which uh, time of resorption or barrier effect was two, was from two, eight to 12 weeks in time. So they stated that the slow resorption membranes, for example, like this pericardium membrane, showed the higher cellular proliferation and also higher barrier effect. And this is important, really crucial. Also, if you want to separate this, the, 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 the different layers of epithelium and connective tissue from the bone. This is quite important. I will show you in this case this concept. It's a patient that came to our clinic to treat two different kind of defects in the posterior site, same patient, remember? And this site, we are gonna test the slow resorption of the membrane. And in this site, in the left side, we are gonna test uh, <clears throat> the natural collagen membrane. Then we have a, 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 lateral, a, a lateral deficiency, a horizontal deficiency, in combination with a sign of lifting procedure. As you can see, we go for first for the sign of lifting procedures in both sides. Then we place our membrane. Remember, this one is the pericardium membrane, and this one is a natural collagen membrane. Okay. This is how we uh, stretch the, the membrane without pins, without stabilization of all the, the membranes, only with the membrane and the sonograph. Okay. And this is how it ends after the after surgery. Now, nine months later, we have uh, this result at the posterior side in the left, in the right side and in the left side. Remember this part is the pericardium membrane and this part is a natural collagen membrane. When we raise the flap, this is the, the clinical aspect of both sides. As you can see here, uh, the impression that I have is that I gain more bone in this side than in this side. Also, the vascularization could be better in this side than in this side. So after that, you can see the, 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 the comparisons between before and after. And this is before and after. But in this case also, we went for the taking sad biopsies in order to see how is the maturation of the bone in both sides, in order to see the differences in terms of maturation of the bone in both sides. And this was, this were, uh, those were the, the biopsies. And this is the histomorphometric analysis of both sides. Remember, normal resorption. You can see here the bone mineral units, called as osteons as well, immature bone like this. In, in most of the biopsy. So we can say that this part, they are mature bone, but more immature bone in the normal, normal resorption site. However, in the slow resorption site, we can see more osteons, more bone mineral units than in the other side. So we can state, if you want to more mature bone, more bone mineral units. In our surgeries, we, we have to go for the slow resorption membranes in order to increase our bone mineral units and more uh, autogenous bone. And this also match with this kind of uh, concept. Also, we have cases in which we have a small defects and we have also have cases in which we have uncontained defects. And we can see, <coughs> sorry, that this is the resorption in time. If we want to treat this kind of defects, we should think what is the better option for this kind of defects. And we have to see, or we have to select the best option for this kind of defects. And also what we want to reach with our surgery, if we want to regenerate inside the contour of the bone, or we want to compensate going beyond the bone contour. So if we think a little bit, selecting our materials 
for our surgeries. If we want a defect like showed with before, an uncontained defect, we should go for the slow resorption membranes, like this. Why? Because this is a critical defect, and this is not critical. We can regenerate with the uh, independent from the kind of material and the kind of uh, membrane that the, regenerate, the regeneration will be acceptable. But in this case, it's not because it's quite risky, quite more risky than the other side. That's the that's the <clears throat> the reason that in a defect like this, if you want to, if you select our material, we perform a good surgery, and we think biologically, we can reach this kind of uh, results. What is, which is the rational for the optimization of soft and hard tissue in implant surgery? What is uh, the reason in which we have to go for augmenting the soft a harsh tissue in implant surgeries because we have situations like this is a pristine bone in which we have drilled the bone and we have cases like this with a little a quite thin quite thin buccal bone thickness after the drilling and also we have quite uh, quite wide thickness when we have the we have drilled the bone. In this case, this prospective pilot study with a follow-up of one year in 22 patients, they placed 30, 39 bone level implants in pristine bone. And they performed the randomization between the thick bone type biotype and the thin bone type biotype. It means that the, the thick bone biotype ha, uh, had more than two millimeters of soft tissue at two millimeters, more than two millimeters of buccal wall thickness after the drilling, compared to the thin biotype with less than two millimeters of soft tissue and hard tissue. And the results were this. As you can see, regarding the soft tissues, there were no differences in terms of distal and mesial pre implant bone loss at one year. There were no statistical significant differences. However, there were a little bit more body implant bone loss in a group of thin biotype than in the thick biotype. Regarding the, in the initial buccal bone thickness, less than two millimeters and more than two millimeters, the mean buccal bone loss at one year was much higher, statistically significant higher in the thin biotype, less than two millimeters, than compared to those that have a thick biotype, more than two millimeters. So if you have a case like this before, and we have to place our implant this, according to this literature, we should perform a guided bone regeneration at this time in order to protect the bone and in order to uh, have a stable results a long time. However, the other part is to prevent perimplantitis, to prevent cases with perimplantitis. And as we know, we have a strong risk factors like poor oral hygiene, history of perimplantitis, and no regular maintenance. However, the main one should be the poor oral hygiene, which is related as well with the soft tissues. Why? Because if we have a shallow vestibular depth the pay in the posterior side, the patient could not have the capability of uh, brushing his or her implants at that side. Or for example, another thing should be the lack of keratinized glucose around those implants. We are going to see that in this case that the lack of the vestibule should be of another risk factor because in this six year longitudinal retrospective study in 61 patients with, two, with 234 implants, they distinguish between a control group with an adequate vestibular depth of more than five, four millimeters with a shallow, compared to the shallow vestibular depth with less than 
for uh, four millimeters. In this case, they found that the patients that have a shallow vestibular depth have a more bleeding improving, a more print pocket depth, and also more or higher radiographic bone loss at six years. So if we don't have enough vestibular depth, we should implement the soft tissues as well. As you can see in this cross-sectional study, in 237 patients and 831 implants, they look for peri-implant disease indicators. And they establish not only the number of implants, the plaque, which is the good, the, the oral hygiene conditions, and also the pre pocket death, but also the lack of keratinized tissue. Because patients who had less than one millimeter of keratinized tissue present 2.48 fold risk of having pre implant diseases. But also, this was confirmed by this study. These authors, this is one friend of mine, this is Alberto Monge, performed this prospective cohort study with a follow up of three years as a mean in 37 patients with 66 implants. And this is important because they performed this study in erratic maintenance compliers, in patients who didn't uh, go or didn't come to our clinic for a regular maintenance uh, program. And in this case, they look for the periodontal outcome variables, such as pre uh, pocket death, breathing on problem, superation, or plaque uh, or marginal bone level. As you can see, in patients who had less than two millimeters of keratinized mucosa presented more pre pocket death, more breathing on problem, and more marginal bone loss compared to the patients who had more than two millimeters of keratinized mucosa. And also regarding the, the, the frequency of pre-implant diseases, patients who had less than two millimeters of keratinized mucosa presented a higher percentage of pre-implantitis patients and a higher percentage of mucositis patients. Why this is important? Because we are finding situations more often like this, or situations like this, or in other situations like this, or even with the best implant that you can place, can have perimplantitis if you don't take into account these conditions. You have to plan, you have to think before placing implants, what, one, what you want to achieve in a long-term prognosis, not only in, a, in early time, in the middle term prognosis. In the, we have to go further, we have to go move further in time going the long term prognosis of our treatment. And this is important to take into account. What about the efficacy of lateral bone augmentation? You have to think that we have two kinds of lateral bone augmentation simultaneously to the implant placement and also First of all, we go for the uh, stage lateral GBR, and then we have to go for the implant placement. And in this case, regarding the group one, the most used technique in this uh, systematic review was the xenograft in combination with the resolved membrane, with the bone gain as a mean of 4.28 millimeters. Let's see one case. For example, this patient that have a fracture of the uh, right canine and the right uh, premolar, first premolar, and we have to go for the implant placement. After extraction and raising our flap, we have a defect like this. So in this case, I place two implants. After that, we have to go for the lateral bone augmentation with our slow resolve membrane fixed by means of pins in the lower part and also in the palatal site, uh, all, uh, also to increase the soft tissues at the, at the level of the canine, we uh, added a connective tissue graph at this site. 
This is how we end the, the, the surgery. This is the, the periapical X-ray result. And this is two weeks after, after that. This is six months after that, you, have, you, you can see the, the health of the tissues, the volume that we have achieved in this case. Look at the volume. This is the contour I want to achieve. This is the contour I want to have for the implants to protect our implants. Also, the creatinized tissue that we have. We want to um, take advantage of this soft tissue to model with a provisional restoration. And little by little, we are modeling our soft tissue with our provisional restoration. And this is how it looks like after eight months of treatment. Look at the thickness that we have at this side. Look at the thickness that we have at this side. Only with uh, planning our surgery, treating according to our principles, and then we can model soft tissues. Like this to end the case like this. Of course, it's not acceptable to me because we wanted to perform in years at the anterior side and change all the, uh, all the crowns. However, the patient didn't want it, so we have to feel feel the expectations of the patients and not our expectations. And this is crucial. On the other side, we have the stage lateral GBR, in which the, the, the mean of bone gain should be 3.9. And in my opinion, it's quite, quite less than expected. However, if we follow the principles that I explained before, combining the result and brain with the mixing autologous bone with a xenograph, we can go up in the mean bone gain with uh, up to 5.6 uh, millimeters of bone gain with this kind of procedures. And let's see different cases, but in these cases, of course, this is the, the current situation that is more often in our clinics and they came to be treated to our clinics. And let's see this case. We have implants affected by peripantitis in the upper jaw, like this, also here, with a, probably a sinus communication at this level. Also, we have lost all the implants in the lower jaw with uh, extensive bone loss in the whole implants. So when we are treating, we are, first of all, we are doing non-surgical therapy. In this case, we had the, the, all, the whole prosthesis uh, came out with the implants. So after that, we have to wait for the, for the healing at this side. So we want to treat the upper, the upper jaw. So in this case, after the non-surgical therapy, we have this situation. We have a sinus communication here, a sinus communication here. And we have to treat this part and also this part. When we are raising the flap, this is the situation of the implant in the premolar who had an extensive bone loss. So we uh, went for the explantation at this side. And after that, you see uh, here the sinus communication. This is the bone loss that we have to, we, we had to deal with. And this is how we treat it, by means of the combination of autologous bone, xenograft, and slow resolved membranes. Fixing them by means of pins, stabilized by means of pins. I place one pin here, another here, another here, and two in the palatal side. This is how we end the surgery. And this is six months later. You see the volume that we have gained in this case, the whole volume that we have gained in this case. And this is how it looks like after six months after the surgery. This is before, this is before, and this is after. Look at the bone quality after six, seven months of the surgery. 
Go for the lower yield. Remember that we have we had this situation. We went for the expansion. We wait for the uh, soft tissue and uh, bone tissue healing. We has, we wait for three months after that, and this is the situation after three months. Does it look like before the surgery we have? Too much defects in soft tissues and also in hard tissues. Look at that, the distraction after the brain panditis. And this is look like after raising the flap. We have the we have to raise a really extensive flap. After that, we have to debride all the defects. The next step should be the cortical perforations in order to increase the angiogenesis. I did not present the randomized clinical trial defending uh, the, the, the cortical perforations. And this randomized clinical trial said that if we perform the cortical perforations, we will have a higher increase of new vessels and also the new uh, osteons around our generation compared if we don't perform this kind of cortical perforation. So the cortical perforations are crucial in guided bone regeneration. So after that, we go for this technique. You see the mix of autologous bone and xenograft and the slow resolved membrane fixed or stabilized by pins. Look at the, at the lingual side, the number of pins that I place to stabilize the three membranes. Look at this. You see? The main main should be stabilized uh, like when you are passing your finger uh, up to the table. It's really hard. It's quite hard. That's the urban said when he is, pre he is presenting his technique. This is the, the double layer suture. This is how it is look like after the the regeneration seven months later you see that we have fulfilled all our um our goals of our treatment increasing the bone quality and the bone availability by means of our regeneration you have this is how it looks like seven months ago and you see here look at this Look at the volume of bone after six months of guided bone regeneration. More than one centimeter of bone gain in this case. We are placing our implants. This is the provisional restoration in the, in, in the upper jaw and also in the lower jaw. This patient right now is going through the final prosthesis, expecting to do some Connect the uh, free gingival graph on this side and also this side. Go for the vertical bone augmentation. We have three different situations that we, we will discuss later. But before that, we should discuss the efficacy of vertical ridge augmentation. In this case, this randomized this systematic review performed by Isman Urban and also with our group, with Eduardo Montero, and also Ignacio Sanz. Sanchez, they pulled all the techniques in four categories. The first one, destruction osteogenesis, GBR techniques, independent from the PTFA, PTFA membranes procedures and resorbable membrane procedures, bone blocks, in which the query technique is included as well in this, in this site, and finally, the particulate synthetic grafts. Regarding the GBR and uh, non-resolved membranes, the mean of bone gain vertically is 4.42. But if you look at the urban technique, the mean is going up to 5.4 millimeters. If you look at the resolved membranes techniques, the mean is 3.5 of vertical bone gain with the titanium mesh the mean is 5.2. And finally, with the bone blocks, it's 3.4, but with the Kuri techniques, which is this one, the shell technique, 
the bone gain, the vertical bone gain is going up to 5.4 millimeter, as well as the urban technique. So it's quite similar, the vertical bone gain with both techniques. Finally, with particulate, particulate synthetic wraps, we can achieve only a mean of vertical bone gain of two millimeters. Going through the median size defects, it means that defects between four to six millimeters of vertical bone defects. We can do different, different kind of techniques, but I'm gonna show you two, uh, two cases. In this case, it's a patient with a post two posterior mandibles with two different uh, vertical bone defects. This is the CBCT scan, the CBCT analysis, in which we can see the bone defect that we have to, we want to regenerate in a vertical uh, situation. And this is the clinical situation. After raising the flap, we have this situation in which we have release the lingual flag like this. If you see here, there's a, a little incision with the tip of our scalpel, with the, only the tip at this side, and then with a rounded instrument, we separate the mucosa and the submucosa. So in this case, we are leaving all the muscle fibers attached in the internal uh, oblique internal uh, oblique linear. So, uh, internal oblique reach. So in this case, we can place our implants, a 3.5 millimeter implants and four, four millimeter implant on the posterior side. Also expecting that we want to regenerate in a vertical manner. This is the, how it looks like after placing our grass, 50% of autologous bone, a 50% of sonograph with a PTV membrane, fix it by means of pins, a double layer suture. This is the long term, six months later, nine months later, and this is how it looks like then one year later. This is before and this is after. Then we raise the flap, and this is before, before regeneration and after regeneration. Look at the bone, the bone volume that we have uh, achieved with this technique. Look at the bone volume that we have achieved with this technique. We place our abutments, then we increase the, the thickness of soft tissue by means of a soft tissue matrix, in this case, we and uh, we end the surgery in this uh, step. Go for another uh, case like this. Remember the first case that I presented, patient with brain implantitis that we went for the extraction, we wait for the healing, and this is the case. This is the initial situation after the extraction of the implants. We have lost more so much interproximal uh, bone at this side and also at this side. So we went for the vertical bone augmentation by means of PTFE membrane, like this that we fix in the uh, palatal site. And then we place our sonograph in, a, in combination with uh, the autologous bone. And you see the separation between the membrane and the tooth. And this is crucial because you, you don't have to, and is, is not allowed to, approximate so much the membrane to the tooth because of the risk of having uh, uh, infections or for example also um, uh, perforations of the membrane of the soft tissues so this is how you look like after the 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 flap closer eight months later is before and this is after. Look at the bone gain in the, the proximal side. This is before, and this is after. This is when we raise the flap. Look at the bone gain in, in the proximal part of this stuff and also at this stuff. This is before, 
and look at this. We have the bone here and we gain bone until here. Then we place two implants and we finalize the case with the connective tissue graft. And after that, when we have the volume, we started with the provisional restorations in order to model our case and also by doing also the increase of soft tissues by means with this technique that I'm gonna present and is described by Isvan Urban two years ago. We are placing a free gingival graph in the in the uh, apical side and between the free gingival graph and the keratinized mucosa around the implants, I place a soft tissue matrix in order to be a scaffold of epithelial cells from the free gingival graph to the coronal part of the implants. And this is the result. The result two weeks later, um, one month after that. Going for, for the last case, and I, I'm going to end with this case, which is a large defect. It's a one centimeter E defect in the anterior sextum, caused by also, of course, brain implantitis. And we have a defect like this. A defect without no supporting bone, but also we have two peaks that facilitate our procedure. So we went for, in this case, for a query technique by, the mean, by, by means of using cortical plates or senogenic cortical plates in this case. So we raise the flap, we measure our defect, we manage the soft tissue, you can see all the gland the gland conducts, the gland ducts, like this. So by means of a random instrument, we can separate this, the, the, the mucosa of submucosa and separate the, the submucosa from the salivary glands. As you can see here, and achieving a great flap release on this side. We are fixing our xenogenic cortical plates like this. Then we fill this box with the uh, uh, autogenous bone and also sonograft. Then we close our box with another cortical plate. And finally, we place a, 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 a collagen membrane, a pericardium membrane a, over the, the box in this case. Finally, we uh, perform the flap closure like this, a double layer suture. This is the uh, two weeks skin This is before and one year after that. This is before and one year after that. This is before and one year after that. So we uh, went for the implant installation tracing our flap in this manner in order to uh, press, preserve all the soft keratinized tissue. In this case, we went for the uh, screw removals. Sometimes it's quite hard to remove all the screws because sometimes you have the screw in the lingual side and it's quite difficult to remove it. Then we place the implants and once the implants were placed, then we went for the A little regeneration of those defects caused by the implant of the scrolls uh, search in this case. We regenerate all also with another uh, pericardium membrane and we finalize the case like this with the suture. This is the healing and this is before and this is after with the provisional restoration. So to conclude my presentation, I would like to remark some uh, issues. That inadequate diagnosis may minimize the future complications in a daily clinic, that the selection of a technique and the biomaterial is crucial in our clinical success, that the lateral and vertical bone reconstruction procedures may offer a stable situation in a long-term scenario. Remember that we have to plan 
our surgeries in a long-term prognosis, and finally, that the, the use of bone reconstruction procedures for dental implant therapy is crucial in the prevention of very large vertical bone defects that have presented due to perimplantitis. Thank you so much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you stay safe in your in your in your home at your home. And uh, I would like to answer any question that you can have. So, my friend. Oh, Adrian, congratulations for your presentations and uh, for your uh, impressive cases. Congratulations. And uh, if you like, we have a couple of questions for you. Perfect. Go ahead. Uh, so, the first question is uh, how did you deal? with the communication with the sinus. You showed a case uh, with the a sinus communication during your presentation. How did you deal with the yes. communication? It depends on the, if there is a membrane perforation or there is a membrane perforation. If there is a membrane perforation, I have to deal with uh, some elevation of the sinus membrane in order to uh, give room to a membrane in order to cover the perforation. And then I can place, a, for example, with, uh, with in this case, uh, the, the mixing of uh, autogenous bone and sinograft. But also I have to uh, elevate some, a, a little bit, a little bit the sinus membrane in order to give room for a collagen membrane and to deal with the, this kind of communication. If I don't have any com any communication of the or any perforation of the membrane, uh, I didn't do anything. Only I place a little bit, for example, a collagen uh, sponge only, and then I place my material and go for the regeneration. Okay, okay, okay. So, so mainly you, you try to close the perforation with the, with the resolvable membrane, of a, this or is this very small, uh, only a collagen sponge is enough? Exactly. Okay, okay. So, we have another question for you. Um, why didn't you graft the lower jaw immediately after implant extractions? Okay, that's a good question. Do you remember but the, the case? It's a, it's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 whole, the whole lower jaw. Mm -hmm. It's right, yeah. It's right? Yeah. Uh, so in, in this case, when I extract the implants, I had so much inflammation uh, in, in that case. I have so much inflamed tissues that I cannot deal with that. So it depends on the, how the tissues are inflamed or not. I decided to go for the, uh, for the regeneration at the same time of the extraction or not. That okay. was uh, my... my, my, my yeah. The other option was to, to make a, a rich preservation, I, I, I guess, the, because of the for, for example, but For example, but the, the tissues are so inflamed. So in, in order to, to not to have so much resorption, expo, expo, exposure of the graft, I should place any, for example, soft tissue uh, matrices or, for example, connective tissue graft in order to increase the soft tissues and not to have a, a exposure of the graph in that, in that case. Mm -hmm. So that's the way of the large defects that decided to wait a little bit and then go for the renovation. Okay, okay. And the result was, was very, very good as well. Yeah. So we have another question for you. Uh, what was the cause of extensive bone loss for upper and lower jaw around implants in this case? Was it hygiene, general health, prosthetic? This in is the, the question. Uh, uh, repeat the question because I, I, I missed so it. So what, what was the cause of the extensive bone loss? In, the, in, that in, in which case? I, I guess, I, I don't know, but uh, from, from the question, I guess in that case. Uh, the, the extensive bone loss probably I, the, should be the, the, the oral hygiene probably. Also the oral oh. hygiene and also the lack of uh, vestibular depth as well. 
And also, okay. it should be other other kind of, of things. Uh, for example, the 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 situation of the connection of the implants to the prosthetic. It means that if you don't have any abutment of more than two millimeters, you can have more marginal bone res more resorption. And then, if you don't you don't have, for example, don't good oral hygiene, you could have extensive bone loss because all the bacteria. And the, the treaters in that case could go farther and farther and, and provoke or cause extensive volume as in this in this case. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, we have other questions if you like to answer. So uh, when combining the graft, what do you do to place autograft adhesant to the implant and xenograft outside or just mix it up 50 50. yeah it's a, it's a good question there's a, a experimental study looking at uh, this this uh, question and trying to to answer this question and this experimental study uh, done by by daniel Busser and naini uh, three years ago they stated that Independent from the, the where is the autogenous bone, the result will be the same. But have to be autogenous bone with a xenograft. If there is no autogenous bone, there will not be so much uh, osteogenic cells inside the, the inside the, the defect. So you need mm -hmm. osteoblast in order or bone cell, uh, bone forming cells in order to have bone around the particles. Okay, mm -hmm. this is this is the quite quite important. Why we mix it? Why we mix the, the autogenous bone with the uh, xenograft? Because we are uh, taking the advantage of both things: the bone forming cells of the autogenous bone and the scaffold and no contraction of the xenograft in this case. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, the issue. I, I, I totally agree with that. And so your your protocol, your normal protocol, is to, is to mix it up. Exactly, mix it up, and uh, mine as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, another question is: in case of the full mouth rehabilitation, so the same case. When we extract, <laughs> extracted the lower arch implants and the GBR anteriorly, did the patient was eating without any provisional restoration? And if so, wouldn't it cause reabsorption of newly forming bone? Uh, it could be, but there's no, uh, there is no um, evidence about that. In this patient, particularly, I place a, a immediate uh, prosthesis after the extraction of the implants. In order to have uh, some chewing from the from the extraction to the to the next the, the next surgery. After the next surgery, I didn't place any prosthesis because I wanted to have an uh, an eventful healing of this kind of surgery. It's quite 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 important because when you are dealing with this kind of rehabilitation, this this kind of uh, reconstructive surgeries, the uneventful healing is crucial. You don't have to push your surgery uh, and all the material with uh, some prosthesis in, in this case. You can uh, also, you can do it with, by means of um, temporal uh, implants. They are like uh, 2.8 uh, 2 or 2.5 millimeter implants in order to uh, place, for example, a uh, overdenture over two uh, over two pairs or over two locators for example and then you can go for the for for the um, for the uh, regeneration in that case but i didn't have enough bone to place those implants even in the anterior part you only have like six millimeter in mesio distally in the anterior part so i didn't have enough bone to place it so that's okay that's the issue that i didn't place any kind of um, of temporal restoration in this patient. I have to wait only. Okay, okay, okay. Another question is, um, if you can repeat, 
in what cases do you see do you use pericardium membranes uh, I, I think now, uh, nowadays uh, i always use pericardium membranes for the lateral bone augmentation in regards to the vertical bone augmentation when i need more than three four five millimeters it's impossible, as you have seen in the in the paper of uh, Isvan Urban, that the efficacy of resolved membranes is around 3.5, 3.2 millimeters as a mean. So, if you want to achieve more than three, four uh, millimeters in in vertical in vertical bone gain, we have to go for a non resolvable membranes, the PTFE membranes, or the other side you can go for the Curie technique. In this kind of cases, there are only that uh, those kind of uh, procedures that I would like to to use in those cases. Mm -hmm. And and would you go for vertical regeneration if if you have to gain two or three millimeter with resolver membrane as well, like uh, uh, for example Merli and co-workers? Would you indicate? Vertical bone regeneration with resolvable membranes, or or you you go directly to the non-resolvable membranes. It depends on the case. Is it the posterior side, and I have only two millimeters of vertical bone defect. I would like I would like to go for the for the resolvable membranes, which is quite easy to use, and they don't have any so much uh, risk complications. Well, risk of complications in this kind of uh, procedures. But for example, in the anterior side, it depends on what we want to uh, achieve with our treatment. So also, this, uh, this will be um, based on your planification, on your planning before the surgery. It's what we want to achieve with your surgery. Mm -hmm. If you have, a, for example, only two millimeters of bone gain in the anterior side, I will, I could do it with a resolved membrane, for example, and also with soft tissues, increasing soft tissues vertically. Could okay. be a, a possibility. To, to, to compensate with soft tissues. And exactly. This is a, uh, my personal question. Um, how, how could you manage the putting osteopenes on the lingual side in the anterior mandible? It's quite difficult. <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite difficult because uh, sometimes you have to place the, the patient uh, before uh, smashing uh, the the um, the, the pin, uh, you have to say to the patient that close a little bit your mouth like this. If the patient is like this, you have to say, okay, close a little bit your mouth like this. Then you have to push. You you can push the cheek like this, so you can manage better your 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 pin. But it's okay. always quite difficult. Also, the other, the other, the other uh, option that you can use is the profix screws. The, yeah. the profix screws, the, pro, the profix screws are a, a auto retentive screws that they don't need any smash uh, anything like this. Only with your with your implant driver, you can drive your profix screw and fix your membrane. It's quite easy. But also, it's too expensive. Yeah, 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 yeah. Could be a solution as well. And thank you very much for your answer. We have um, a last uh, question to be answered. Um, hello, congratulations for your presentation. Uh, in the last case, you showed in the lower anterior area. Uh, would you do anything to augment the soft tissues? The yeah, in, in, in this case, I, I, I went for a soft tissue augmentation, but only in, in, in width, not in, in, not in the distance from the, from the coronal part to the apical part, only in, in width of the flap, I mean. So I placed the connective tissue graft, uh, from the tuberosity, which is quite quite fibrous, and then I I replace the uh, the soft tissues over that kind of graph. Why I try to do to do this? Because some paper published by Inamo many years ago said that if you place 
your your connective tissue at the mucogingival junction is coronal or or apical to the initial initial um, mucogingival junction uh, position, uh, it will it will be back to that place. It means that if you place coronally your mucogingival junction and you place your your connective tissue graft, this mucogingival junction junction return to the initial position. Mm -hmm. So it's I will I. Matter of this, of, in of this case, I, I, I like it to prove it. This uh, this hypothesis of this uh, of this study. So that's the issue, or that's the uh, the cause of that I didn't go for the uh, for the free gingival graph in this case. Okay, okay. Well, the question was I'll augment the soft tissue. So uh, exactly. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, so, mm, congratulations for your presentation. It was very good presentation and uh, uh, spectacular presentation of Fadi as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you very much, guys, to participate in thank this you, webinar. Uh, it's uh, one of our uh, first experience with Klockner and uh, webinars. Uh, I think it's been a very positive experience and uh, it's uh, one of the best way to, to share uh, our knowledge and culture with, with, with other people uh, for, for, for free and uh, I, I feel very uh, uh, good after this, this, uh, this webinar. Uh, if you want to add something, Karian, that you are the official <laughs> moderator. <laughs> no, uh, thank you so much, uh, both of you guys, for for participating with me in, in this in this afternoon, this evening. It's a pleasure to me to see you and to share with with both of you knowledge and evidence. Also, to to share with all the people that have been uh, watching us in this afternoon this evening and also i would like to give a message of hope that we will uh, we will leave this situation we will overcome this situation together all the world together and also with patience i, I will help to you and all of the world to overcome this situation so guys i think that we have uh, uh, enjoyed all the afternoon. To me, I enjoyed so much. Fadi in Lebanon, in Beirut. Oh, yeah, right. uh, it's a very nice experience and uh, uh, a very good idea and hope to do it uh, because as uh, Matthew and you said, it's uh, sharing knowledge and uh, seeing each other because we used to see each other maybe three, four times per year. Now we are doing webinars to see you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hope to see yeah, you back in Lebanon and uh, you too, Matteo. Maybe uh, when uh, this uh, pandemic will be over. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. To see you soon. So, Jauma. Uh, uh, yes. So we you can finish the the webinar. Thank you. And congratulations for for your job during the webinar. And that's it. See you. I hope that you are you are fine. See you okay. next time. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much for the support and for the help, Jamma. Bye bye. Thank Goodbye. you so much, guys. And bye. I hope you were well. So stay at home and stay positive. Stay safe. Stay safe. Stay safe as well. Bye bye. Uh, bye, bye guys. guys.